Eight two Brute. I love treason, but I hate a traitor. Men willingly believe what they wish. Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for attending our new swan trial of Brutus in Julius Caesar. I'm Julia Lupton. And I'm Eli Simon, and we are the co-directors of UC Irvine's New Swan Shakespeare Center. We'd also like to thank UC Irvine Law, Berkeley Law, and Stanford Law for their tremendous support of this endeavor. So let's take a minute to talk through the basic plot points of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. We're going to give you a very brief overview on the action. This takes about 15 seconds, so listen up. The year is 44 BCE and the city is Rome. The popular general Julius Caesar has been appointed dictator and is acting more and more like a divine monarch. A group of senators convince Caesar's friend Brutus to join their assassination plot against Caesar. To stop Caesar from gaining too much power and destroying Rome's Republican institutions, Brutus and the conspirators kill him in the Senate on the Ides of March. Mark Antony, a dedicated follower of Caesar, drives the conspirators out of Rome and fights them in a battle. Brutus and his friend Cassius lose the battle, and then they kill themselves, leaving Mark Antony to rule in Rome. And now we'd like to take a moment to introduce two distinguished new swan actors who will be presenting critical monologues that inform our trial tonight. Here is Maya Smoot, new swan artistic advisor, Maya holds an MFA from UC Irvine and is regularly featured in the festival. Maya will be playing Mark Antony. And let's also welcome Greg Unger, New Swan Associate Artistic Director. Greg is a core company member at New Swan and professor of drama at the University of Denver. Greg will play Brutus. So act three, scene two presents the public funeral of Julius Caesar. Brutus is going to explain to the people of Rome why the conspirators have murdered Caesar. Not unlike a trial, Brutus intends to convince the populace that he and his conspirators were justified in their violence. The conspirators led by Brutus also allow Mark Antony to speak to give honor to Caesar. While it's not necessarily a rebuttal, Mark Antony dissects Brutus's arguments, intending to sway the audience against the conspirator. Our director, Beth Lopes says, these pieces felt like the perfect text to present for Brutus's trial. We also wish to remind you that Caesar's body and his bloody garment riddled with stab wounds are present on the stage. Given our virtual performance, you'll have to imagine this as you listen in to Brutus and Antony. Romans, countrymen, and lovers, hear me for my cause. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Would you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. 
There's tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? Who is here so vile that will not love his country? Here's the body mourned by Mark Antony, who though she had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the Commonwealth, as which of you shall not? With this I depart, that as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, so I have the same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. Do grace to Caesar's corpse and grace her speech tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony, by our permission, is allowed to make. I do entreat you let no man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoke. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turned with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus have told you, Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it were a grievous fault and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak at Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms to the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the holiday I thrice presented him a kingly crown which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and sure he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? You all do know this garment. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. Look, in this place ran Cassius dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this, the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly knocked or no. For Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Oh, judge, you gods, how bloody Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen. 
then I and you and all of us fell down whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Good friends, I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise and mutiny. Thank you, Greg and Maya, for those performances. And now, please allow us to introduce the esteemed lawyers and judge for our mock trial. I am very happy to introduce my former student, Bernadette Myler, the Carl and Sheila Spaeth Professor of Law at Stanford Law School, where she has taught since 2013. Professor Myler's scholarship focuses on British and American constitutional law, the history of the common law, and law and the humanities. In this trial, Professor Myler will be defending Brutus. We are also thrilled to welcome back Erwin Chemerinsky to our third New Swan trial. Professor Chemerinsky was the founding dean of UC Irvine's law school and is now dean and Jesse H. Choper Distinguished Professor of Law at Berkeley Law. He has written many books, including Free Speech on Campus with UC Irvine Chancellor Howard Gilman. In this trial, Professor Chemerinsky will be prosecuting Brutus. And the Honorable Andy Guilford is a judge at the United States District Court. He has received many awards and recognitions and is a frequent contributor to the programs of UC Irvine Law. He will be presiding over today's trial. And now the Honorable Judge will give you, the jury, instructions on how we will proceed tonight. Romans and friends from around the world. This criminal court is now in session. Marcus Brutus. Marcus Brutus has been charged with the murder of Julius Caesar and inciting insurrection against the Republic of Rome. This is his trial. You are the jury. You will now hear the case argued by Dean Shemerinsky for the people in prosecution and Professor Dr. Myler for the defendant, Marcus Brutus. When they finish, I will instruct you on this case. The law that applies here will be the law of the state of California. Dean Shemerinsky for the prosecution. Will you begin? Thank you, Judge Guilford. Judge Guilford, esteemed opposing counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is an honor to appear before you, or to put it another way, friends, Californians, Zoomers, lend me your screens. We are here not to praise Brutus nor to bury him. We are here to convict him. Tonight, I wanna to tell you a story about a man who was convinced that he alone knew what was best for his country. The story of a man who believed that he alone could save his country. It's a man who initiated an insurrection to do so. It's a man who caused great harm to his country in doing this. That man is Marcus Brutus. 
But the events of the last few months show us that Shakespeare has written a timeless tale of what happens when a man believes that he alone knows what is best to make his country great again and takes the law into his own hands. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have a record for this trial. It is the play Julius Caesar. You must make your decision solely on the basis of this record, this evidence. What I say to you, what Professor Mailer says to you, is not evidence. The evidence is the play Julius Caesar. And it is on the basis of this record that I would suggest there should be no doubt as to the verdict in this case. There are two charges. There are thus two questions that you must answer tonight. First, did Marcus Brutus commit murder? If you read the play Julius Caesar, the record before you, there can be no doubt. After Professor Mailer and I present our arguments, Judge Guilford will instruct you as to the law. In order to convict Marcus Brutus, guard to murder, you must find four things. That Brutus killed Caesar, that Brutus did so intentionally, that Brutus planned this beforehand, and that Caesar died as a result of Brutus' action. The play leaves no question with regard to these four issues. Shakespeare tells us, indeed, that Brutus stabbed Caesar. Shakespeare tells us that Caesar was still alive when Brutus stabbed him. So Caesar could utter the famous words, the title this evening's trial. Nor can there be the slightest doubt that this was planned in advance and that it was an intentional murder. Here, you need only look at the play, at the words of Marcus Brutus. Brutus said, and I quote, our course will seem too bloody, Caius Cassius, to cut the head off and then the limbs. Let's be sacrificers, not butchers. Take more of Brutus's words. He said, and I quote, in gentle friends, let's kill him boldly, but not wrathfully. After the murder occurred, Brutus confessed to the crime. What could be stronger evidence than Brutus's own words? Brutus said, once more quoting his words, as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the dagger myself, which will please my country to need my death. Brutus made very clear that he was the one who had killed Caesar. He said over and again that this is what he did. He said, but Caesar was ambitious. I slew him. We know then that this was planned in advance. It was intentional. It was what killed Julius Caesar. Now, what's Professor Mailer going to say? The record seems so clear here. I assume that she's going to try to tell you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is that what Brutus did was for the good of Rome, that it was necessary to protect the country. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, people cannot take the law into their own hands. We cannot let any person who believes the country better off with an assassination go ahead and assassinate the person who leads the country. In fact, here, this was not based on what Caesar had done. Read the Shakespeare play closely, and you do not see any indication that Caesar was violating the rights of the people of Rome. Instead, what this was about was fear that Caesar might become a king. Three times, though, he had been offered this and refused it. There was no reason to believe that he was going to accept it. There's no reason to believe 
that he couldn't be stopped if that should come to pass. And again, the very words of Brutus tell us that this wasn't a murder that was based on what Caesar had done. It was based on fear of what might happen in the future. Brutus says, and I quote, and therefore think Caesar is a serpent's egg, which hatched would as his kind grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. This was a preemptive action. It was about trying to stop something, not a remedy for what had occurred. That Brutus says is another point, quote, he would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there is the question. This was a concern about what might happen in the future. There was no necessity here to kill Caesar. This was Brutus simply taking the law into his own hands and committing murder. There is a second question before you, the jury. Did Marcus Brutus incite insurrection? Insurrection is an attempt to overthrow the government. Of course, here, the insurrection occurred. Marcus Brutus, by assassinating Caesar, caused an end the government of Caesar, and as the second half of the play, Julius Caesar tells us, threw the country into great turmoil. Here too, Judge Guilford will instruct you is the law. In order to convict Brutus of incitement, you'll need to focus on two questions. First, did Brutus, by his words or his acts, intend to cause the overthrow of the government? And second, was his conduct imminently likely to cause insurrection? Again, the words of the play Julius Caesar leave us absolutely no doubt. Here I would focus you on the scene where the co-conspirators come to Brutus's door. What does Brutus do at that point? Does he listen to his wife and stay home as she exhorts him to do? No. Does he say to this group, we shouldn't go and kill Caesar? Assassination is wrong? No. Instead, he leads this group. He leads the group to kill Caesar. In fact, Brutus's words were, let us kill him boldly. What could be clearer words to incite the overthrow of government, to have an insurrection, than, quote, let us kill him boldly. And those who Brutus led, stab Caesar over and again. But they, of course, were not the ones to kill him. The last stab, the final death blow, came from Brutus. Those who assassinate rulers always tell themselves it's for the good of their country. When John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln, he said in Latin, thus unto tyrants. When Yigal Amir killed Yitzhak Rabin, he believed that he was doing something for the good of his country. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if you acquit Marcus Brutus, you are sending a message for all time that assassination is legitimate so long as the assassin believes that it is justified. That cannot be right. That was Shakespeare's point that people should not be taking the law into their own hands. And so ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the verdict here should be clear. Guilty on both counts. Guilty that Brutus murdered Caesar. Guilty that Brutus incited insurrection. Thank you. And now, Professor Myler for the defense. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I come not to disparage Caesar, but to defend Brutus. Indeed, Caesar personally, although he was killed, is not at issue in this case. 
As Brutus affirmed on many occasions, he had no personal cause to spurn at Caesar. And in fact, he loved him. This case is not about Caesar, nor is it about Brutus. It is instead about the concerted efforts of members of the Roman polity to uphold the long-standing freedoms of Roman citizens acquired under the Republic and to insulate the Roman constitution against the threat of a dictatorial and tyrannical leader. We have heard from my esteemed colleague for the prosecution that Brutus is guilty not only of murder, but also of inciting insurrection. Insurrection against whom, I would ask? Surely not the Roman state, of which Brutus has remained a faithful part. No, I would urge you instead to see Brutus's act, one that he took with great reluctance and with considerable caution to avoid further bloodshed. That act was the justifiable execution of a traitor to the state. Caesar was in the process of erecting himself as a king and a god rather than a participant in the Roman Republic. And he therefore could not be removed through ordinary means and by a peaceful transfer of power. Brutus and his compatriots, for these reasons, erected their own tribunal outside of the ordinary courts to judge and convict Caesar. This tribunal, like the Nuremberg Tribunal set up and run by Supreme Court Justice Jackson following World War II or other international tribunals, found ample reason to condemn Caesar to death. We would not accuse those operating those international tribunals of murder, and neither is Brutus guilty of that offense. As jurors, it remains your power to judge of the facts and the law. You must render verdicts according to your conscience, as has long been the tradition within our legal system. And I will give you ample reason as jurors to determine that although Brutus did kill Caesar, and opposing counsel has shown the incontrovertible evidence that he did kill him, that killing was justified by necessity. Furthermore, Brutus is innocent of inciting insurrection because his act was taken in protection of the Roman Republic rather than to undermine it. And he limited his actions to the death of Caesar rather than killing any other members of the government. Let me walk you through the evidence from the play. I agree, the, uh, the play is our evidence. That's our text here. That's our uh, record here. Let me walk you through the evidence that Caesar violated the core precepts of the Roman Republic, and that these violations were the reasons for the tribunal's actions, reasons in which Brutus was confident enough that he proclaimed them publicly following Caesar's death. First, Despite opposing counsel's protestations to the contrary, Caesar had begun to set himself up as a king. At the beginning of the tribunal's deliberations, members of the Senate had offered Caesar the crown in a gesture he himself orchestrated to test the waters and figure out whether the people would accept him as king. As Caesar discovered, each time the crown was offered to him and each time he rejected it, the people still uh, had some trepidation and praised him more loudly when he re refused to be crowned than when they offered him the kingship. Hence, he refused to be crowned three times over. On the day of his death, however, Caesar fully intended to accept kingship. His wife Calpurnia and others had warned him not to go forth in public on March 15th, the Ides of March, given the multiple indications of danger to his person. Why did he heedlessly disregard them? Because the prospect of becoming king that very day urged him forward. It was immediately after Decius spoke with Caesar that he decided to go to the capital, that Caesar decided to go to the capital. And what did Decius tell Caesar? He advised him that the Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. The sequence of events here establishes Caesar's clear intent to become king, at least throughout the Roman Empire, if not in Italy itself. Even though Decius may have misrepresented the Senate's plan for March 15th, 
It was only a matter of time and a short time at that before the Senate would again offer Caesar the crown and he would ultimately accept. At that point, it would have become significantly more difficult to restore the Roman Republic. It was urgent, therefore, that Brutus act quickly to take care of Caesar before the ruin of the entire polity. Secondly, Caesar had already promoted himself as a god on earth and established images of himself throughout Rome that were designed to amplify his status as dictator and supreme ruler. Caesar set up figures of himself hung with trophies. When the tribunes of the people, Flavius and Morellus, tried to remove them, they were summarily disposed of. Although we don't know exactly what happened to them, it seems they were disappeared. As Casca mentions, Morellus and Flavius for pulling scarves off Caesar's images are put to silence. Imagine if President Biden appropriated military funds through the National Emergencies Act to reshape Mount Rushmore in his image alone. That's the equivalent of what Caesar did to promulgate his image and make himself a god of the city rather than a mere mortal. His self-representation was more like that of King Kim Jong-un than a leader of a republic. Third, Caesar fought wars of aggression outside of Rome, conquering other areas, and even killing the friends of Rome, like Pompey, in the process. Among other places, he laid claim to France, Belgium, Egypt, Britain, and parts of Germany. His entire object was to transform the Republic of Rome into an empire and to colonize other civilizations. Waging a war of aggression is a crime under customary international law. And it's also a crime under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Caesar was a prime offender in this regard, as Brutus and the fellow members of his tribunal recognized. Fourth, Caesar had already undermined the constitutionally protected freedoms of Roman citizens, contrary to what opposing counsel suggested. As Brutus explained in the immediate aftermath of Caesar's death, his choice was to either allow the Romans to become bondmen or slaves or to protect Romans' ability to be free men. Brutus didn't take that opportunity to specify what freedoms were at stake, but it's common knowledge that Caesar instituted a law allowing him to choose all magistrates as well as all consuls and tribunes, thus depriving the people of a voice in their government. Fifth, Caesar wielded his power of pardon like a tyrant, rather than as a Republican ruler. Although he had been excessively merciful in his imperial battles, sparing many enemies in order to gain fealty for himself, he unreasonably refused the pleas of Brutus and several others to pardon former Senator Publius Cimber, revoke his banishment and restore his rights. Through this refusal, Caesar displayed a continuing vindictiveness for his political enemies that indicated he would suppress all dissent once he achieved his ambition of being crowned king. Brutus considered all of these circumstances before determining that it was necessary to kill Caesar for the good of the Roman state as a whole. And on no occasion did Brutus express a position against the Roman state. To the contrary, he was attempting to preserve the Roman Republic in the face of the existential threat posed by Caesar's ambitions and action. From the beginning of when he contemplated taking action against Caesar, Brutus emphasized his own interest in the public good of Rome. He proclaimed allegiance to the general good and stated that he had no personal cause to spurn out Caesar, but for the general. After Caesar's death, Brutus also insisted on furnishing public reasons of Caesar's death, reasons that he had developed over the course of his work with the tribunal. Brutus loved Caesar, but his love of Rome and of the freedoms of the Roman citizenry was greater. Cassius also ensured that Brutus would believe that he must act on behalf of the Roman people who were imploring him to stem Caesar's tyrannical ambitions. On Cassius's insistence, fake letters were thrown into Brutus's window at night, seemingly from the Roman people. One letter urged Brutus to strike, speak, and redress. Brutus thus believed that his actions were demanded not only by other high-placed men in the Republic, 
such as Cassius, but by the general citizenry. Finally, Brutus was clear that Caesar alone should face the punishment of death. He therefore refused to agree when Cassius and other members of the tribunal suggested that Mark Antony must also die. In Brutus's view, this further step would have meant excessive bloodshed and went beyond the mandate to protect the state. He was careful to try to avert a reign of terror and instead participate in a just and justifiable tribunal. When arguing that Mark Antony should be spared, Brutus insisted that this shall make our purpose necessary and not envious, which so appearing to the common eyes will be called perjurers, not murderers. As you will hear from Judge Guilford, necessity is a valid defense to murder in California. What Brutus did, while regrettable, was his only option in the effort to protect the survival of the Roman Republic. Let me briefly run through the elements of necessity for you to demonstrate their applicability in Brutus's case. To establish the defense of necessity, I must show that it was more likely, that it is more likely than not, that Brutus first acted in an emergency to prevent a significant bodily harm or evil to himself or others. As I have explained, the emergency was upon Brutus when he acted. At the very next opportunity, and possibly even on the Ides of March itself, Caesar would have accepted kingship, altering the Roman polity forever. Second, Brutus had no legal alternative. As I have elaborated, Brutus lacked any legal options given how Caesar had already consolidated power within the state, ensuring that he and he alone would choose all magistrates, consuls, and tribunes. Third, that Brutus's acts did not create a danger greater than the one avoided. As you have seen, Brutus was careful to restrain the tribunal from any excesses and refrain from undue violence that would have increased the danger of civil war. Although civil war did indeed result, the responsibility for that falls on Mark Antony, who, as you have heard, stirred the passions of the people through his inflated rhetoric. Two minutes. Fourth and fifth, when Brutus acted, that when Brutus acted, he actually believed that the act was necessary to prevent the threatened harm or evil, and a reasonable person would also have believed that the act was necessary under the circumstances. As I have tried to demonstrate based on what he knew, as well as what Cassius and others persuaded him of, Brutus believed, as any reasonable person would have under the circumstances, that his act was necessary to preserve the state. As we often hear, the Constitution is not a suicide pact, neither are the criminal laws. And finally, that Brutus did not significantly contribute to the emergency. Nothing Brutus did as a friend of Caesar would have led to Caesar's decisions to abuse his power and none of his actions propelled Rome further towards empire. To the contrary, he assiduously maintained the values of the Republic. While Brutus fully admits to having killed Caesar, we absolutely reject the idea that this act was murder. It was an act he deeply regretted, but found required by the necessity of saving Rome. Turning to the charge of incitement to insurrection, Brutus took every precaution to ensure that his actions would not redound to the disadvantage of the Roman state, nor incite insurrection against it. In the immediate aftermath of Caesar's death, Brutus took to the public stage to calm the citizenry and furnish his rationale. He also reached out to Caesar's allies and to indicate his good faith allowed Mark Antony to speak at Caesar's funeral. It was that speech rather than any of Brutus's actions that aroused agitation and led to civil conflict. All of Brutus's activities were directed not at prompting insurrection, but rather at eliminating a threat to the Roman Republic and ensuring citizens enjoyment of their liberties in times of peace. Under California law, Brutus's action is justified by necessity, but if it were not, what would prevent Governor Newsom from taking over the courts and declaring himself king with impunity if he could muster sufficient forces? What would present, prevent a tyrannical president from occupying California and rendering it a police state? Brutus already threw himself on the mercy of the Roman people after killing Caesar. He stood ready to be stabbed with the same dagger he used to execute Caesar whenever it proved in the interests of the polity. He now seeks your mercy too and hopes you will show the same compassion and understanding as the citizens of Rome who knew too well how close they had come 
to be being bondsmen to a tyr tyrant rather than citizens of a republic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Myler. And now in rebuttal, we'll hear Dean Shemarinsky. A to Professor Myler. Imagine on January 3rd of 2021, someone who decided to assassinate Donald Trump, thinking he was a serious threat to the country, was going to cause an insurrection. Would that assassination have been justified? No matter how much the assassin believed it was for the good of the country, that person should have been and would have been convicted of murder and of inciting insurrection. We do not allow people to assassinate rulers because they believe that the rulers might do harm. We insist that they use other means to prevent harm. In this instance, the play Julius Caesar makes clear that Brutus is guilty of both charges. Let me discuss the first. Did Marcus Brutus commit murder? Professor Myler tells you many things, but she doesn't deny the key facts that Brutus killed Caesar, that Brutus did so intentionally, that Brutus planned this beforehand, that Caesar died as a result of this. Well, what does Professor Myler tell you? First, that Caesar was about to make himself a king. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that is pure speculation. Three times Caesar had been offered to be king and he had turned it down. She tries to infer from his going on March 15th that he wanted to be anointed king. There is nothing in the record before you to suggest support for that inference. Moreover, even if he was going to make him king, so okay, that doesn't justify assassination. It doesn't justify murder. Second, she says, that Caesar was putting his images around Rome. Go into any federal building today and you'll see Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's images. Rulers did it then, presidents and vice presidents do it now. So what if they would wanna put their image on Mount Rushmore? I think it'd be wrong, but it wouldn't justify their being assassinated. Third, she says, there was a tribunal. This wasn't a tribunal in any meaningful sense of that word. This was a group of co-conspirators plotting to assassinate the head of the government. If their plot is a tribunal, then literally any conspiracy to kill can call itself a tribunal. Fourth, and this is really the core of a defense, she says it's necessity. And in order for any of these facts to matter, they would have to amount to the legal defense of necessity. Well, as Judge Guilford will instruct you, in order to find necessity, you need to find all of six things. First, that Brutus acted in an emergency, done a significant bodily harm, or even himself or others. There was no emergency at all. Caesar had given no indication he was going to be anointed as king. And even if so, it doesn't constitute an emergency. Second, you have to find that Brutus had no adequate legal alternative. Brutus proclaims he was a dear friend of Caesar. Why wasn't his alternative to try to convince Caesar not to let himself be anointed as king? Why didn't he try that simple alternative? Third, you have to find that Brutus' acts did not create a greater danger than the one avoided. But we know from the record before you, the play Julius Caesar, that his acts did create great harm to Rome. It created chaos in governing. Fourth, a reasonable person to believe that the act was necessary under the circumstances. No reasonable person would believe this. Brutus was duped by those who would be helped by Caesar's assassination and Brutus took it on himself. And finally, that Brutus did not substantially contribute to the emergency. Brutus did so very much. Professor Myler says that Caesar was doing bad things. He was waging a war, even though he was enormously popular for doing so. That he was choosing magistrates, that he was granting pardons, now, most of these things are not in the record before you, they're not in the play. But even if so, they don't justify assassination. There are many ways of changing who's the government in power. Doesn't justify assassinating those. Brutus committed murder. The second charge is that Brutus was responsible for an insurrection. One minute. Here, Professor Myler says to you, who was the insurrection against under the circumstances? 
it was an insurrection against the government of Rome by overthrowing its leader, by assassinating Julius Caesar. Remember what occurs when Brutus leads the follower and says, let's kill him boldly. Why were they killing Julius Caesar? Because they wanted to overthrow him as ruler. They wanted to overthrow the government of Rome. That, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is inciting insurrection. It's in fact committing insurrection. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, if Brutus is acquitted here, you are sending a message for all time that we can assassinate the rulers whose policies we don't like. There are many ways of changing who exercises power in government, but assassination is not an acceptable one. Certainly not in this circumstance, where it's entirely based on speculation. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the only possible inclusion on both counts is guilty. Thank you, Dean Shemarinsky. And now in rebuttal for the defense, we have Professor Myler. So counsel for the prosecution has conflated this situation with the situation where a, a regular ruler would be suddenly assassinated by a political opponent. That's absolutely not this case. Make no mistake that Caesar had already gone forth and changed many, many aspects of Rome and of the uh, Roman Republic and had rendered it almost not, uh, not even a republic anymore. He had rendered it almost an empire, almost a dictatorship. He had become a dictator by the time that this assassination occurred. So this assassination, as, as my opposing counsel calls it, is not a simple political murder of a political opponent, but instead was the last gasp attempt to save the Republic in a time of extreme emergency. Now, we all would agree that assassinating rulers is generally to be frowned upon and should be condemned criminally. Uh, but what happened in this instance is not like that. It's more the act of someone trying to retain um, a Republican or Democratic form of government when that was under extreme threat and under the threat of an extreme necessity. Um, if any doubts remain in your mind as well as to whether Brutus acted out of necessity, I ask that you contemplate the efforts of Cassius and others to convince Brutus that that necessity existed. Given the facts as they had constructed them, who could resist the conclusion of necessity? Indeed, if you feel that someone was guilty of murder or of inciting insurrection, I would urge you to consider Cassius, not Brutus. From the beginning, Cassius was intent upon unseating Caesar because of personal jealousy, not the public spirited reasons that Brutus acted upon. As he vituperated, this man, meaning Caesar, has now become a god and Cassius is a wretched creature. Overhearing Brutus's worry that Caesar might become king, Cassius played upon his concerns. Early on, Brutus recognized that Cassius was trying to persuade him of a perilous endeavor. Into what dangers would you lead me? Caesar himself expressed concern about Cassius, noting young Cassius has a lean and hungry look. Later on, Cassius sent a fake letter into Brutus's window at night to further convince him of the facts as Cassius wished them to be perceived. As he plotted, I will this night in several hands in at his window's throw, as if they came from several citizens, writings all tending to the great opinion that Rome holds of Brutus's name, wherein obscurely Caesar's ambition shall be glanced at. Furthermore, Cassius was responsible for bringing other Romans into the decision to kill Caesar. He had a lengthy exchange with Casca to this effect and concluded by saying, there's a bargain made now you know, Casca, I have moved already some of the noblest minded Romans to undergo with me an enterprise of honorable and dangerous consequence. If anyone is guilty of murder or inciting insurrection, it is Cassius who recruited all of those involved and persuaded Brutus of the necessity of killing Caesar. Even if you were uncertain about the extent to which under California law, you were permitted to acquit Brutus, you should know that as jurors, you possess the sacred right to decide on the law as well as the facts of the case. Judge Guilford won't instruct you about this right because the Supreme Court has decided that even though you have this right, you don't have to be told about it. 
But in this country, ever since John Peter Zanger was acquitted of libeling the royal governor of New York, juries have weighed culpability with their consciences. And in the late 18th century, Chief Justice John Jay let the members of a jury at the Supreme Court itself know that despite the normal distribution of responsibility between judge and jury, they nevertheless have a right to take upon themselves to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. For all of these reasons, I call upon you, the people of California, to do both justice and mercy and to acquit Brutus. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And now I will read to you the applicable jury instructions. As I said before, this is under the law of the state of California, whose flag you see behind me. Here are the jury instructions. In order to sustain its burden of proof, the crime of murder in the first degree, the government must prove the following essential elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Defendant Marcus Brutus killed Julius Caesar on or about the Ides of March, March 15th. Brutus killed Julius Caesar intentionally. Brutus planned to kill Julius Caesar beforehand. Julius Caesar died as a result of Brutus's actions. Necessity is a valid defense to the crime of murder. You may find that Brutus acted out of necessity if defense counsel demonstrates that it was more likely than not that Brutus acted in an emergency to prevent a significant bodily harm or evil to himself or others. Brutus had no adequate legal alternative. Brutus's acts did not create a greater danger than the one avoided. When Brutus acted, he actually believed that the act was necessary to prevent the threatened harm or evil. A reasonable person would also have believed that the act was necessary under the circumstances and Brutus did not substantially contribute to the emergency. In order to sustain its burden of proof for the crime of incitement to insurrection, the government must prove the following essential elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Defendant Marcus Brutus spoke or acted in a way intended to incite insurrection. Defendant conduct was eminently likely to cause insurrection. If you as jurors determine that the government has proved these elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you must find Marcus Brutus guilty. If a reasonable doubt remains, or in the case of murder, if you find that Brutus established that it was more likely than not that he acted out of necessity, you must find him innocent of the charges. That completes the instruction. And now in this modern age, we hope to soon see the ballot placed on the screen for everyone to vote. There now appears the ballot. Please simply mark the ballot by checking one of the circles. And once you have checked one of the circles, hit the submit button at the bottom. Your votes are now being tallied. Make sure you vote on both of the counts.
perhaps as we've created a courtroom in the past, we're seeing how courtrooms in the future might take verdicts. We have about 87% in, so last call. And I'll ask the bailiff to post the results now, anytime the bailiff feels correct. All right, I hope you can all see this. Here is the tally. Marcus Brutus is guilty of the murder of Julius Caesar. Marcus Brutus is not guilty of inciting insurrection against the Republic of Rome. Marcus Brutus, the jury has spoken. Please take the defendant into custody. Well, that ends the trial. And- uh, <laughs> That was so exciting. Well, I, let me just uh, let me just invite Miss Lipton and Mr. Simon to uh, appear again. And as they are about ready to appear, I do want to uh, thank them, and I want to thank the New Swan Shakespeare Festival, which produces incredible performances of Shakespeare um, with superlative actors like we were blessed with tonight. And it all is done under the stars at the University of California at Irvine in that incredible, charming little theater behind our two folks here. So I invite you when you get a chance to attend the new Swan Theater and enjoy that, uh, that theater we see pictured there. Thank you, Eli and Julia. Well, thank you, Judge uh, Guilford. We were, you know, this is not a rehearsed event. We don't know what the lawyers are going to argue, and we don't know how you, the jury, are going to vote. So we were just as excited on, and on the edge of our seats as we hoped that you were. We want to thank the judges, the judge, and the two lawyers, uh, Professor Myler and Professor Chemerinsky, for an extraordinary effort at preparing the instructions and their arguments. It's really um, the essence of this is the, the effort and seriousness of their preparation. And of course, our amazing actors and director uh, for the scene work. And I think we have actually a little bit of an epilogue, right, Eli? Yes, we do. And uh, we're very excited. Before we say goodbye, uh, we'd like to invite Maya Smoot back to our virtual stage for an epilogue as spoken by Mark Antony after the death of Brutus. Brutus was the noblest Roman of them all. All the conspirators did that they did in envy of great Caesar. He only, in a general honest thought and common good to all, made one of them. His life was gentle, and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Brutus. Thank you, Caesar. Thank you, judges, jury. Everybody could come back on just for a second so we can say goodbye to our audience. And also just thank you again for an extraordinary effort. We had a split vote on our charges. So our lawyers clearly did a fantastic job with their cases. And uh, we hope we'll be back next year somewhere, somehow, uh, to continue uh, exploring Shakespeare through, through legal reasoning, which is really a very special form of inquiry and performance. So thank you guys so, so much. Thank you all, and thank you everyone that tuned into this virtual trial. We really appreciate your your being here with us. Although we we can't see you, we feel your presence, and uh, we hope that you are safe and healthy. 
and thank you for uh, joining us. And again, thank you to all of our wonderful performers. Uh, this is just a fabulous trial. Thank you so much. And everyone behind the scenes, all of our great tech and stage management. We have a, an incredible team that put this together and we're grateful to everyone. Thank you so much and we'll see you soon. Thank you.